I have never preached on the patriarchal law before this series as a full series of lessons, and it's been an interesting study. I believe that it's helpful to us. Uh, we've studied, as we've been studying the patriarchal law, the word patriarch means father rule. It's a, it's a compound word. It's from two Greek words, patros or pater, father, and arche or arka, arkao, to rule. So it's a father rule, and the system was set up by God where the father was in charge of his family, and he led them, and he was the priest for the family. God communicated with them, and we've seen how he communicated. But let's look at Romans 1, verses 18 through 32 of Romans 1, deals with the Gentiles before they obeyed the gospel. That is, the Gentiles under the patriarchal law. And we see a number of things that God called sin. And he, we see things they should have done and things they should not have done under this law, which means that God had a law because the book of Romans twice tells us if there's no law, there can't be a sin. So if there's a sin, there has to be a law. So they had a law. Unrighteousness is one reason for sin. Now, the last lesson we dealt with ungodliness. It is the wrong attitude toward things. Now, the un unrighteousness, we'll have to define it, but we'll define it in just a moment, but it is a different aspect of, of our, it's our actions, more of our actions. So unrighteousness is one of the reasons for sin that people sin. Of course, on the other side, we should be righteous instead of being unrighteous. And we'll, once we define it, we'll see what righteousness is and then we'll know what unrighteousness is. It's the absence of it. Many sins that the Gentiles committed while they were under the patriarchal law can be classified as unrighteousness. Some of the sins are sins of attitude or based upon a wrong attitude. And that would be ungodliness. And uh, we see now that there are sins of actions themselves in verses 18 through 20, 32 of Romans 1. One of the things that we see here is unrighteousness can hinder the truth. It can actually, the King James uses the word hold, but in the older English, if you took hold of something, it couldn't move. And you could actually, that can hold you back. And uh, so that, that can happen too. Hindering the truth was a sin under the patriarchal law. So we see another principle here. When we go to the New Testament, we see that as well. We see that causing somebody else to sin or not helping them to learn what they need to do or hindering them in any way from serving God is a sin itself. Now the New Testament teaches that. Basically, what we're finding out is all the moral principles of the patriarchal law are the same as the Christian. So, you know, I'm just not preaching on just patriarchal. This all applies to us, too, because we see that these laws apply to us. Matthew 18 tells us about causing someone to stumble. Jesus said it's pretty serious if you do that. In Romans 1.18, the American Standard reads, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness, see there's the wrong attitude, and unrighteousness of men who hinder the truth and unrighteousness. The King, the King James says, who hold the truth. And again, in the older English, you could grab hold of something that can't move or you're holding it back. Think of it in that sense, to, to hold back, as the King James uses the word hold. And that, that means to hinder. It meant that in the, when the King James was translated. King James was translated in 1611. And uh, then the English language took, th I think, three letters out of the alphabet and added two or three more in. So the alphabet was different. So they had to revise the King James Version because it had obsolete letters in it. And uh, so what we get is that uh, that. The translation we have is the 1769 
version of the King James, if you have a King James version. So it's 1769. That's probably the one you're using. Okay. Oxford and Cambridge translated it or redid it. Okay. And then they standardized some of the spelling as well. Okay. Changed the spelling of some of the words. So we can hinder, we can hold it, and in 1769 it meant to hold it back. Righteousness is when one treats everyone by the same standard. That's what righteousness is. It's a hard thing to treat everybody by the same standard because I have people that I like a lot and some that I don't like very much. Some people are very likable and some people are just kind of not very likable at all. And it's a hard thing to treat them both the same. And if someone's not nice to you, it's real hard to treat them fairly. But that's what Christians ought to be about. And that's what God expected the, the, under the patriarch of them to do. So righteousness, when we treat everyone by the same sin. Let's look at Deuteronomy 25, verses 13 through 16. And we're going to define the word just or righteous. Now, the word just and the word righteous are the same word in the Hebrew language in the Old Testament. The, the same Hebrew word is translated just sometimes and righteous other times. In the New Testament, the same he Greek word is translated just and righteous at the various places it's found. It's translated both ways in their English. And, and, of course, it's the same word. So what we have here, and there are quotations from the Old Testament into the New equating the Hebrew and Greek words so they're basically equated to one another. So right, right here he says, Thou shalt not have in thy bag diverse weights. Now, that diverse means different. And so a great and a small. So when you're, when you're selling and buying things, if I'm really slick, and I'll use that term, I'm going to cheat people. I'm buying from someone. Let's just say I'm buying grain from somebody. You normally bought it in a, by the volume, not, not by the weight, but let's just weigh it. So we're buying this something we weigh. And so I'm wanting to cheat you. So I have a, I have a real heavy weight over here, and on my balance scales, you got to put more of your stuff you're selling me, and so I get more. And then when I'm going to sell it to the other fellow over here, I have another weight that's lighter than it should be, and he doesn't get as much. And just think about what we're doing here. You change your weights. You change the rules, and so. In the United States, uh, most most of the states, I assume, do this. Oklahoma does. They have a weights and weight and standards department or division in the state government, and they go out and they'll they'll, they'll go into a gasoline station. They will just pull a pump out, and put put it in, measure how much is there. They they check them. They just go they go do that. They'll go check the scales at the various places where they sell stuff by weight. They just well, they can walk in and, and make you let you let them check your scales. They can just check it on a moment's notice, and so that's good because we we're pretty certain that we're getting a fair price for you know we're getting a fair weight. But you see, they had diverse weights, and he said, "Thou shalt not have in thy bag diverse weights, a great and a small. Thou shalt not have." In thy house, diverse measures, the great and the small. And again, now let's talk about buying wheat now. You're buying grain that did it by volume. And so we would have, in the United States, we buy it, sell it by the bushel. It's a quantity. It's a dry measure. Well, they had the ephah, and that was like a quart measure, something like a quart. And so they would take this volume and buy it. Now, you got this little basket out here. I'm buying, and again, I can have two baskets, one when I'm buying and one when I'm selling, different sizes. Now, I get, I get to cheat people both ways. Got one that's too big when I'm buying, so they got to give me more. When I'm selling, got one that's too small. That's how you cheat people. And he said, you shall not do that. That's not what you're going to do as, as God's people. You don't do that. A perfect and just way. Now then, he defines it and uses the term. 
Your weight is to be just. It's to be perfect. It is to be the same weight when you buy as when you sell, and it's supposed to be the right size weight when you buy and sell. So a perfect and just weight shall I have, a perfect and just measure. See the word just? That's what we're talking about here. So whenever we're dealing with people now, we get this in mind. We treat all people by the same standard. That's righteous. A just man will treat people by the same standard. That's real hard for me not to favor my children and my grandchildren. Because, you know, they're the best best uh, at this and that and everything else. Well, that's just not right. Because the fact is, I need to tr judge them and deal with them the same way I deal with other people. Now, again, I realize there is a special sense in which we favor our family. But not in dealing with wrongdoing and right doing. We don't justify our, our kin our close friends, and let them get by with something and then real hard on the other person. So we have to be careful of that. That's, a, that's something we have to be very careful of. A perfect and just weight shall they have, a perfect and just measure shall they have, that thy days may be long in the land where Jehovah thy God giveth thee. So you are to do this in order that you live in this land a long time. It's not talking about how long you live on this earth. It's saying you as a nation can stay in the land of Canaan and live there as a nation. Whenever we get to where we're cheating people in our business dealings, we're corrupt inside. A corrupt person does that. And when the people get all corrupt, that nation of Israel was not going to survive. Israel, the small nation it was, could not survive against their enemies unless God was with them. They're too small. But with God with them, nobody could whip them. Nobody could take them out. In other words, if God's with us, who can be against us? And God will be with us as children of Israel, they could say, as long as we're faithful, as long as we obey him. He will take care of us. That's what the Jews had to understand. And when they lost the land, it was not because God wasn't powerful enough. It was because... He turned his back on them because they turned their back on him first. For all that do such things, all that do unrighteously, see, have a diverse set of weights, is unrighteous, are an abomination unto Jehovah thy God. Now then, we've used the, the principle of our fortiority. What's true of the lesser is true of the greater. If God demands and he sees an abomination when we cheat people in our business dealings, he's going to also see it when we treat them in other ways too, when I treat them differently in other ways. This is what we see here when we study it. When we study this very clearly. We understand principles. We treat people by the same standard. That's, that's very critical. That's what righteousness is about. Now, what he's saying is, under the patriarchal law, they were expected to do that well as well. It's not just under Christianity, not just under the law of Moses, but always God has demanded that we treat people fairly. The golden rule that most of us are aware of, and we usually paraphrase it, do unto others as you'd have them do unto you, that's how we usually paraphrase it, and that's a good paraphrase. It, it gets the thrust of it, but it's not exactly how it's worded, so we're going to look at how it's worded. But it gets that. That's the point, though. All things whatsoever you would, now the word would is not the auxiliary verb would, it's, it's that you will, the will of the mind, that your, your, your intent is, that men should do unto you, even so do ye also unto them, for this is the law and the prophets. But in Matthew 22, we see that the law and the prophets is to love God and love your neighbor. So the golden rule is all about love. Righteousness is all about love. You see, it all comes back. It's all, it all fits together. The Bible fits together here. So you do what you would like to have done to you, you do that to others. Now, the assumption is, the assumption is, 
that your heart's right and you don't you're not one of these twisted persons in your mind that likes to be hurt now there are people that enjoy being pain and they're, they're just crazier and alone i don't enjoy pain but they do and they're masochists and sadists some people like to inflict pain and some people enjoy b being uh, hurt uh, and uh, he's not talking about those kind of people. They're sick in their mind. He's talking about a normal person here. So what you want and what you'd like to be done to you, if you like for people to lie about you, then you, you, no, you don't lie about them. And God still doesn't let you do that. But that's what he's saying. If you don't like people lying about you, don't lie about other people. If you don't like people stealing from you, don't steal from other people. See, that's a pretty good rule to go by. But let's look at Luke's account of it. Luke, and it's a re recording of a different sermon. So Jesus gave it different words, different place. Not a contradiction, just different sermon. As you would that men should do unto you, do you also unto them likewise. Now that's kind of where the paraphrase comes from, probably from Luke's record of it. But very simply, if I don't like for people to steal from me, I shouldn't steal from anybody else. If I don't like to have lies told about me, I shouldn't be telling lies. And most of us don't like for people to steal from us and lie about us and, and be nasty and mean to us and talk to us ugly. Don't like that. But if you don't like that, then don't do it to other people. Don't talk about other people. That's pretty simple. Isn't that pretty simple? I think it is. Pretty simple. That's what righteousness is all about. You see? We're going to judge and treat everybody by the same standards. Many sins that the Gentiles committed while they were under the Patriarch Law could be classified as unrighteous. We're going to look at some, and I'll try to show you how these are classified in that category. I think he classifies sins in Romans 1.18 into two different categories, and that's sins of ungodliness, improper attitude, and sins of unrighteousness. Now, it may be that an ungodly attitude caused you to be unrighteous. See, they they could be linked, and they are frequently linked together. But we're talking about the major cause of it: the dishonoring of their bodies. Romans one twenty four. Now, in a sense, it's ungodliness. It's a wrong attitude toward things that God has set in motion. So we 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 can be ungodly about it. But he gave them up in the lust of their hearts unto uncleanness that their bodies should be dishonored among themselves. Now, when we look at some of the ways that people are unclean, not talking about washing dirt off your hand, talking about uh, uncleanness in the sense of sinful uncleanness. People take advantage of other people. If I take advantage of someone, haven't I been unrighteous? But I want people to take advantage of me. See? Under those conditions, we wouldn't. So just put yourself into the position when you're going to make a decision about anything, say, would I like for this to be done to me? And the answer, if it's no, you don't do it. And then, of course, if it goes contrary to the Bible, you don't do it either. But a very good way to, to check it is to ask that question. So right here, they've dishonored themselves, dishonored their bodies. Now in Romans 1.26, let's skip down to verse 26. For this cause God gave them up unto vile passions that their women changed the natural use of that which is against nature. The word that's translated women here is not the word, normal word for woman. It's a different word. And it should be translated females. And here it's, it's lesbians. And uh, what we have here is uh, it, by using female instead of woman, which would be an adult woman, or woman versus girl, they had perverts that were lesbians that were having sexual relations with little girls. And uh, this was one of the things that went on in their society. It's, it's rampant in the first century. It goes on to America today. And it's an evil thing. And that would definitely be unrighteous. Why? Because a little girl has a, the, the power of the will to maybe resist it. You're taking advantage of her youth and, and experience. 
So what we see is people taking advantage of other people. That's unrighteous. Of course, it's ungodly too. So both it covers both categories. We get the same situation with regard to homosexual men, and we see men that are uh, pedophiles. And so here again, the word right here, uh, the not using the, the proper use of the woman, that is the marriage bed, men working on seamless, receiving themselves, men lusting toward one another. But it's not the word for men, Norman, grown man. It's the word for males. And so it, it goes into this category, and it gets over into, and it would include, and it was very common, little boys were, were used by men in the Greek and Roman society. It's very common. One of the emperors would have little boys, and they just disappeared. And he killed them. And he was an evil man. But this went on in the Roman society, in the Greek society. It's going on in America today. And so what we have here is that, that kind of thing happens. There's been an accusation of certain men that have been uh, taking little girls, and uh, it's been on the news. Uh, there's a man that was arrested. He supposedly committed suicide in prison. And there's some woman that was with him, and you know, she's testifying. And supposedly some high-powered people were involved in this, men with underage girls. And uh, it was, uh, it's, a, it's a sorry thing. But that's kind of the thing we're looking at here. This is unrighteous. These men are not only ungodly if they did it, but they're unrighteous too by taking advantage of those little girls. That is unrighteous. But let's move on. Let's get away from that. There are a number of other things. Being filled with all unrighteousness, all kinds of unrighteousness. Fornication, which would be the categories we're looking at. Wickedness, we look at these. Covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, malignity, whispers. Now let's look at each of these individually. Look at each of these things. Unrighteousness, we've defined it. Uh, pornea would be fornication. It's uh, sexual relations in general, okay? And uh, many times, a large portion of the time, one is taking advantage of the other person. Wickedness is unrighteousness, and this is a uh, malice toward people. Now, if we go back to the golden rule, if I have malice toward anybody else, that's wrong. Malice is when I want to hurt them. Why would you want to hurt somebody Unless you you got some evil purpose in mind, either by words, actions, or or even thoughts, hurting someone, doing harm to people—that's what malice is. You know, they talk about he uh, he killed him with malice and a forethought. Well, now that's first degree murder. Okay, I think that's what it would be defined as first degree murder, malice and a forethought. Well, the Bible defines murder. One of the things it says, if he had an, if he had uh, evil thoughts and he, he had the, he was hated him and proved that he hated him before he killed him, then uh, it's probably first degree murder. You put him to death. See, but it's dealing with this malice. I want to hurt you, and I can do it by my tongue. I can do it by actions. I can do it by doing things to you. People hurt, want to hurt other people, so they'll go and spray paint their cars or spray paint their houses or do whatever. But that's malice, and that's unrighteous. Why? I don't want people doing that to me. I'm not going to do that to other people. I just do that to my enemies. Well, you see, I'm not treating everybody by the same standard. I'm not righteous. Now, that's getting to the nitty-gritty, isn't it? That makes it real hard. Because we've got to love our enemies as Christians. That's what the Bible's all about, though. Covetousness. Well, I covet and covetousness. Remember, there's two sins having to do with money. One is covetousness, when you sin to get the money. And the other one is love of money, which when you're stingy with it, once you get it. But you can be both. You can be both. You can be about both covetousness and a lover of money. But right here, covetousness is when I have a have more attitude. This word carries the idea of greed, to have something. And I'm willing to step on you or do whatever it takes to get it. 
In other words, I'm not going to work for it. I'm just going to get it any way I can. And I will cheat people and I'll abuse people to get it. And that's the covetousness. And so it always has in it, in its idea, I want more. But behind it, behind the word, is this willingness to do whatever it takes to get it, including anything that would be sinful. Whatever it takes, I want to get it. Now, that's covetousness. And so, of course, if I'm going to step on you or cheat you or whatever, that's obviously unrighteous because I'm not going by the right standard. See? So it's an unrighteous thing. And we have kakia, the Greek word here. It's maliciousness. And this is, I am going to, when I look at you, I just think you are just, you're just in it to get me or you're just one of these people that you're always thinking evil. I know what you're thinking, and you're not thinking good things. Well, I don't know what you're thinking at all, and you don't know what I'm thinking. You can hear what I say, and you can see what I do, and you can determine that. But you have no business. I have no business judging your motives. God knows our motives. On the day of judgment, he'll judge all our motives. But we should not be in the motive judging business as God's people. Nobody should be. We can't say why someone did something. Now, I can say it's a possibility. I can say if he tells me why he did it, unless he's lying, but we don't falsely attribute worth good or bad motives to people. We, we attribute good motives, we assume they're good until we have evidence to the contrary. That's what the Bible teaches. But maliciousness is this attitude of where malignant and interpretation of action of others. And we attribute to them the worst imaginable motives. I just tell you, I know he's, he's, he's in it to do this. But I don't know that for a fact, thus he tells me. I can see his actions and I say his actions are wrong, his words are wrong, but I can't see his heart. I can't see what's in his mind. I can't see what he intends to. We've got to stop and be careful of that. And that's, we don't want people judging my motives. Do you want them judging your motives and just deciding they know what you're thinking? Well, if you don't want that, remember the golden rule, you shouldn't be doing it to others. Envy. The word envy is always used in a bad sense. Now, jealousy is not used in a bad sense. It's used in both good and bad. But envy is always used in a bad sense. What envy is, according to Trench, now I'm going to read this. It refers to the displeasure of another one's good. Oh, he got his he got a new car. Well, you know, well, he didn't really deserve that car. Well, that's his decision whether he wants to buy a new car or not. Right? That's his decision. Okay. I'm I'm just an old country boy. I'll drive an old car until it falls apart. Okay. But uh, I'll try to put my money somewhere else, okay? But right here, he, he has displeasure that another person is good. The Stoics define it as distress at others' good fortunes. It is the desire that the good of another might diminish, quite apart from any corresponding gain on my part. I don't care. I just don't want you to have that new car or new house or whatever. No, no. Shouldn't see that way. See, that's unrighteous. And again, what we're doing is, I don't like that you've got something good to happen to you. Someone gets an award at school for oh, achievement in something. Let's say they do well in math or, or English or something like that. They get an award. And all the other kids put them down, or some of them do. That's envy. I'll say, that's great that you did well. I'm happy for you. And someone in the in the Lord's church this does something. Something happens. Whenever one of our young people graduates from high school, we'll just be happy for them. One goes on to college or whatever, we'll just be happy for them. We'll be say, great, I'm proud of you. But sometimes we don't do that. I think we do as Christians, we do that real well. I'm talking about we got to be careful we don't get into that kind of mode. That's what envy is. 
I'm going to put you down. I can do it by words. Oh, that's not a big deal. Or I can just even damage what you have. I can let it get into malice and do malicious things against what you got. People will go by, someone gets a new car and they'll key it. They just take a key and rub across it and get paint. You know what keying it is. You probably have heard of that. Or they'll do something like that to it. And so that happens. And uh, that's, it's young uh, teenage boys are bad about this. They go out and vandalize stuff. Why do they do that? Why do they do that? Envy. They didn't work and get it themselves, so they go and vandalize what other people have. It's just plain old envy. Murder is definitely the ultimate in unrighteousness. Oh, I don't want you killing me, but I could murder you. You see, murder is definitely unrighteous. It also is ungodly because God created us with a spirit. And, and Genesis 9 of the patriarchal system tells why you're not to murder. Because we're created in God's image. So that makes us special. That's why you can kill an animal and eat it, because they're not created in God's image. But you can't kill a man and eat him or kill him at all. Murder him. So murder is ungodly as well as unrighteous. Strife, that's when I'm going to fuss. I want you to be in my group. If you're not in my group, I'm not going to treat you right. So we have our little cliques. And so we have this little clique, and uh, we kind of make outsiders of everybody else. There ought not be cliques in the church. We ought to all treat each other equally. And if we don't, there's something wrong with us. We're not righteous. Contention, strife, wranglings, get your little cliques. Deceit. Oh, this is interesting because this is to catch someone or something with bait. Well, you know, Luther White and I went fishing a few times, and we he we kid I tell him Luther, you're using guile here, and he would kid me because guile is bait. He'd put it on the hook and we'd throw it out and get some catfish or something, and so he he had kid me back and forth about using guile, but. Uh, so what we have here is, that's what it is. Now, if I bait you into sinning, I lure you into it by, I, I know how to push your button. You know what I mean by that? I can push your button. When I do that, I'm using guile. I'm using this. I'm baiting someone. I'm luring them into it. So that's deceit or guile. And we don't do that. That's unrighteous. I don't want people baiting me and luring me and saying things to to hit my push my button to cause me to do something wrong. And people do that and they just sit back and laugh at it. But that's not that's not righteous. That's not that's not even godly. It's neither righteous nor godly to treat people that way. Malignity. Now, right here is a different word. It's from the same root, but it's also, it's that bad character. That, and I have this crafty, malicious attitude of wanting to hurt people. Again, this word I think is only found in Romans one twenty nine, But it's from the same root as one of the other words we've had. But it's that bad character. It gets to the heart of the person, the, the intent. It goes back to the, the, the mind, the thinking of the person. This word also, and we'll look at it some more because it's kind of interesting. It manifests itself in the malignant interpretation of the action of others. And so I attribute to them the worst imaginable motives. Again, we get back to the same word we had earlier, but it's a little bit subtle difference here. So I, I, I'm gonna, I don't care what you are. I just don't like you. And I'm going to, I know you got an evil heart. I know there's something wrong with you. Well, you don't know that. I don't know that either. We need to be careful of that. We should note the deep psychological truth that the secondary meaning of this word brings it out. The evil that we find in ourselves makes us ready to suspect and believe that it exists in others. When a person begins to accuse other people of this and this and this, I always get to wonder, is it possible? Is it possible that they're guilty of that very sin themselves? Now you say you're assuming evil. No, I'm just saying, is it possible? 
and uh, the psychologists tell us we do that. We accuse others of the very sins of the very wrongs that we do frequently. The malicious person himself being of an evil moral habit sees himself in those around him. In other words, he thinks everyone thinks the way he does. The book of Proverbs says the righteous is bold as a lion, but the wicked flee when no man pursueth. <laughs> the wicked flee when no man pursueth, but the righteous is as bold as a lion. You know, they, uh, they, uh, whenever a person is guilty, sometimes they just act guilty. You, you can see it. And in the same way, one who's thoroughly evil finds it impossible to believe anything but evil about others. If we're evil thinking, we think other people think the way we think. And so we don't trust them. Because we're not trustworthy. So evil people, that's how they think. And we shouldn't be that way as God's people. Whisperers. Well, we're covering a lot of ground, aren't we? So this right here, whispering. Now, it's not wrong to whisper. Now, what's wrong here is this word as it's used. Now, what we have here is, this is the tail bearer, or as Thayer tells us, it's the secret slanderer, detractor. So I slander, I say, I slander is when you say something that's not true. Detracting is when I'm trying to put them down. Now, there shouldn't be any, any slander in our mouth. We shouldn't ever say anything false about anybody, period. Not at all. That's just out of the picture. You know the word slander is the same Greek word that's translated devil. Who was the who is the great slanderer? Well, it's the devil. You can read the book of Job and see that. He slandered God and he slandered Job. But the secret slanderer, but also one who detracts from other people. He detracts. We we call it putting them down. Do you know people to put other people down? Well, that's wrong. That's unrighteous. That's sinful. It was sinful under the patriarchal. It's sinful under the law of Moses. Sinful in the New Testament. Interesting. The moral code hasn't basically changed at all, has it? When we see that. Romans 1.13 says, Backbiters, hateful to God, insolent, haughty, boastful, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents. Here's, here's the things that we have here, and I don't have time to cover all this because we're running out of time. So I'm going to have to stop right here and stop because we've run about 40 minutes. So I apologize, but I'll come back to this later and do it next week. Right here, if you study this in Romans 1, you'll see a whole series of things, all of which are sins under the New Testament, or if there are things we're commanded to do, there are things that we're commanded to do under the New Testament. This is 21st century material, right for us. Now, they had a different plan of salvation, and I'm going to have a lesson on that, what theirs was, but it covers almost the same ground as ours. There's a couple of few little differences, but not many. So if you're subject to the Lord's invitation this morning, look over the audience, they're all members of the church except the children, you're subject to the Lord's invitation. We not come as we stand and sing at this time.